Thank you very much for attending. It's one of the last uh, sessions of the conference. I know it's hard for all of you. Um, my name is Ricardo Noriega. I'm a principal software engineer uh, working in the Emerging Technologies Organization in the office of the CTO in Red Hat. And <clears throat> That's, I'm Alex Mevick. I work over at Lockheed Martin. I'm a senior infra ops engineer working primarily on edge AI devices. So in this presentation, we are going to talk about, well, how to run efficiently AI models at the edge, uh, of course, using uh, Kubernetes. This talk is meant for you know, infrastructure people. It's not meant for data scientists. But I think uh, you know, uh, we'll explain what we've been doing. And I think I hope uh, you find it interesting. So uh, for, uh, you know, to give you a little bit of background, uh, what is edge computing? It's, uh, that work can mean uh, a lot of th things for, for different people. Um, in our industry, we've been trying to centralize workloads for, for decades. We have built data centers with thousands of servers. We have built you know, distributed computing platforms that we call the cloud. But however, uh, more and more devices are connected to the internet, uh, smart lights, uh, IP cameras, sensors, etc. And they are all generating huge amounts of data that have been transferred to the cloud and uh, across the globe, right? Um, all these industries that you see in the slides, uh, medical, automotive, industrial, defense, for example, FYI, that is one of the Lockheed, Lockheed Martin goodies. Um, they are all generating huge amounts of data. So for us, the definition of edge computing is basically putting computing power closer to where the data is, is being generated. Especially when we talk about running AI models at the edge, uh, we want to do the inferencing process closer to where the data is generated. Imagine you want to run an anomaly detection uh, algorithm. Uh, we cannot afford to send video streams back to the cloud to do that, that process. We need to put the GPUs closer to, to that data. So as you can see in the slides, there are um, these are the type of devices that we are talking about. Uh, these are usually single board computers or systems on chip uh, that have certain limitations or characteristics that need to be taken into account. Uh, limited resources in, terms, in terms of CPU, memory, storage. Um, they are not extensible as servers. We are used to servers, right? Like they have uh, PCI Express slots to plug accelerators, more memory, you know. Uh, they are extensible. Um, usually, they don't have out-of-band management interfaces, which might be a problem you know, to access them sometimes. And they are placed in remote locations where, where network is not present sometimes or is intermittent. So edge computing is not a data center, but has similar expectations. We all want uh, ease of management, security, um, scalability, you know, all these features that we, we have managed to build in, in the cloud. And, you know, we are at KubeCon or CNCF Con. Uh, we tend to focus on the way we package applications in containers. We are all about containers and how to run these applications. However, we believe that the operating system is a critical piece to, to be able to run a network of edge computing uh, devices in a scalable way. One of these features, um, so we, you know, we are calling, um, we are trying to have an, what we call an edge optimized operating system. Um, repeatability is one of these main features that we want to have. So we need to go to an image based operating system approach more than a package-based uh, operating system uh, approach. That means that a user should be able to create their own customized operating system image and you know, uh, plug it into the device or send it to the manufacturer, the hardware manufacturer. So whenever you deploy thousands of devices in, in, in the field, you have the exact same configuration or the, the exact same image that you have built uh, locally, right? Um, on top of that, we have the onboarding process. So once you deploy the, um, the devices in the field, 
we need a way to to um, to onboard them in our device management uh, systems in a secure way. There is this project called FDO, FIDO Device uh, Onboard, that using uh, keepers and uh, ownership vouchers allows you to claim those devices and register those uh, into your own systems. Uh, one other key feature for for of an edge optimized operating system is how to do um, updates and rollbacks in an efficient way. So um, going to this image-based approach, an update would be just to create a new image that is exposed uh, somewhere. So devices will recognize that there is an, an available update and they will download only the deltas, the, the data that is, that is necessary, so we don't you know, download the, the full image back again. And of course, uh, most of these devices are deployed in the field and probably they don't have uh, a way to SSH into the device. And, and so the health of the fleet, you know, getting uh, reports on the health of the fleet is very important. And what happens if a device gets bricked? You know, the configuration of the up update is not right. We need a way to uh, do automatic rollbacks. So we always get a device that is fully operative, operational. So we manage these capabilities by using um, a technology called OS3, or in this case, RPM OS3. So OS3 is a technology that is shipped in certain flavors of Red Hat uh, Enterprise Linux and provides some sort of version control for the operating system. Uh, imagine it like a Git, but for a file system. So most of the file system is immutable. You cannot change it unless you do an update, as I uh, mentioned before. Um, so you see the file system read-only. And if you want to update or, or apply a CDE or any other configuration, you build this, this new image update of the, of the OS. Um, after reboot, so the good thing about this is that you have, uh, you download the, the update of the new image and you stage those changes. And then in the next reboot, you will uh, go to the new state fully transactionally. So these are like two atomic states that you have in your device and you go all or nothing. It's, or you are in a state A, a or B, you know? This makes updates and, and management of devices very easy because you can track uh, changes along the way. We also provide um, a system D service called Greenboot. Basically, uh, runs a, seri a series of health checks, and you can even add your own for the operating system or for the applications that are uh, running on top. And if any of the health checks um, fail, there will be a counter and a num number of attempts. And if Greenboot sets that the health of the device is uh, failed or failure, uh, it will automatically do a, a rollback. So it will point to the previous working version that we have staged in, in RPM OS3, and, in the next, and it will force the reboot, so the next time it boots uh, operational again. It's also worth mentioning that uh, this kind of image-based approach is very good for CI and, and for testing because you can create in your infrastructure the image that you're going to test on or deploy on, the, on, on, the, on those devices and you can test it and you will be, uh, you can be sure that the image that you have tested in CI will be the same as deployed in, in, the, in those devices. Finally, so we have talked about uh, how the operating system is a crucial part of you know, managing a network of edge computing devices. But we, you know, we want to run things on top. We want to, to run our workloads, especially uh, in this talk, AI and machine learning models. So um, to run these, these workloads, we are used to the cloud and we want to use the same kind of tooling that we, we used in, in the cloud. And for that, we needed to provide a lightweight uh, Kubernetes. And this is where Microsoft was born. Um, I'm very happy I was part of the team that uh, created Microsoft from since its inception. 
And I don't know, but um, if you know, but uh, last week, uh, Microsoft 414 has become GA. So it's a big milestone for, for the team. And uh, so the, the benefits that we get having a, a lightweight uh, Kubernetes distribution basically is standardizing on, Kuber on Kubernetes for the software lifecycle, uh, for the lifecycle of, of our software, of our applications. We get the benefits of the orchestration that uh, Kubernetes provides, um, consistency across foot, foot, footprints. Uh, one of the mantras that I love is like, I can de uh, develop uh, you know, in the cloud and deploy anywhere. So this is a, a very cool feature. And you can use uh, off-the-shelf AI frameworks in this case, like, I don't know, uh, QServe, uh, QFlow, KServe, and so on. So this slide basically shows a, a little bit the difference between OpenShift and, and MicroShift in terms of architecture. Uh, for those who don't know, OpenShift is Red Hat's Kubernetes distribution, and it's like a, it's a vertical integrated platform. So OpenShift is responsible for managing the infrastructure that is uh, below, the operating system, all the components and versions from the Kubernetes cluster itself, and the applications that are running on top. However, for Microsoft, we have taken a different approach. We are using the capabilities of um, edge-optimized operating system, as I mentioned before, and Microsoft is just an application sitting on top. So it's basically a runtime. It's not this vertically integrated uh, platform. And Alex will talk about the sexy stuff now. There you go. <laughs> All right. So. Ricky talked a little bit about running MicroShift on top of Red Hat and exactly what that looks like. Um, from there, Lockheed Martin, we're trying to figure out how to run AI workloads on these edge devices. And uh, there's some improvements we're going to need from the standard AI models that you're running in the serving architectures you're using on you know, x86-64 systems um, when we're making this transition over towards these low power ARM devices. So in particular, we're looking to lower resource utilization. You know, we don't have an A100 with all of those Gibby bytes of RAM. We don't have the speed uh, that you're looking for in those devices. And some of the dependencies at times are a little bit difficult to manage. And so what we're using right now today and kind of demonstrating is memory caching using TensorRT and MLC LLM. And um, that's going to mostly be how we're improving running the AI on the edge. Uh, from there, we obviously have to figure out how to host that AI and talk between things. Uh, again, we're looking for speed. We want to have a variety of models running at one time. Um, we are trying to manage the dependencies for these models because they don't all use the same thing. And we're trying to lower our overall uh, resource footprint. And so to do that, we're using this MicroShift Kubernetes offering at the edge. Um, by using microservices and containers, we're able to manage our manage our services independently, and we're able to restart things as they're needed on a per-service basis. So if one model needs to be spun down to maintain a certain power profile, and we're going to pass that data off between the two of them, we can spin one down and spin one up kind of as needed with the benefits of these uh, Kubernetes containers. And for that, we're using gRPC with protobuf, uh, microshift, and a little Flask server. Uh, and then from there, the two main demo Models that we're looking at today are going to be YOLO V8 and um, Vicuña, the 7 billion parameter model. Um, YOLO V8 is a tracking and classification model. We're using it kind of to determine what's in the room, and we're passing that information over to our large language model, Vicuña, that's been optimized with MLC LLM. Um, sure. Yeah, and just to backtrack a little bit and show off the graphs, I guess, to explain what we're doing with those. So with TensorRT, we're getting around a 95% accuracy with uh, YOLO V8 and around a three times speed improvement. It does lower the memory footprint as well, which is obviously important with these edge devices that can be incredibly limited. And then with the LLM, we're seeing a 44 time uh, speed improvement on prefill, around four times on decode, uh, less than 10% utilization on the RAM. 
So in this case, when we were working on these tests, we weren't even able to use the Transformers version of Vicuña on the Jetson NX. Um, and by changing to using this MLCLLM quantized version, we're actually able to run it on a significantly more limited hardware. And from there, uh, we're probably going to show the demo. Yep. Should we change? Yeah, we change a little bit. Wait a sec. So what we're looking at here is a video stream of everybody kind of off of this cheap webcam running off of our little Jetson NX. Um, you can see on the bottom left-hand side, well, hopefully you can read that, uh, we have our different pods running our um, services here. So we've got a web server that's hosting this sort of simple Flask app on top. And then we've got a Vicuña server running the LLM in the back. And we have a YOLO server running our YOLO V8 inferencing. Um, on the bottom right, we have JTOP running, which shows the GPU memory utilization per process. So you can see we're kind of sitting in around that uh, two to three gig mark. And so I can actually ask the model here, so this is a quick chat to Vicuña, asking it um, how many people are here. I guess we could give it a shot. <laughs> a little confused. <laughs> um, I guess as an, another example, I could ask it how many chairs are here. It might get that a little bit better. Too many boxes, right? Yeah, it might be that there's too many boxes. Oh, it thinks there's a motorcycle. Oh, <laughs> down over here it sees a motorcycle. But um, it's getting that information from the YOLO V8 engine through those gRPC connections uh, as a microservice between the two yeah. models. And then um, I can ask it, I guess, really quickly, something else simple. Uh, can you give me three example points this uh, presentation might cover? Might be about, yeah. It's kind of got something. You can see the GPU usage uh, in the bottom right part of the yeah, and so the GPU spikes up a bit, but with that MLC LLM quantization, we're sitting at that five to six uh, gigabyte mark on our RAM, which is really helpful on these edge devices. Uh, and then we can do that just to show that it's actually. This is the funny part of the presentation. <laughs> So you are Boromir from Lord of the Rings. You will answer questions in the character of Boromir in line with the movies. And we'll just ask Boromir where he's from and see what he has to say about it. He's from the kingdom of Gondor in the land of Mordor. Interesting. But uh, it's not like we aren't doing any work here to cut down the LLM or to cut down the vision. As you can see, it's finding motorcycles and other silly stuff in here. <laughs> Uh, that clearly aren't here. Most of what we've been doing is quantizing these and cutting them down so they work on the edge through um, our hosting methods, so TensorRT and MLCLLM. It's all running in the NX in this device. Actually, let me point the camera to the device to see what we are using. Uh, let me see. Can you see? So there's like a battery pack and then the actual uh, compute module is just this little thing with a fan on top. And we are not um, uh, doing any API call to, you know, externally or anything, so. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the frequency? Sure. Um, 
also to show really quickly, I guess a feature of the Jetson we're running in the max frequency mode right now. And so um, if we really want to, I can jump over in my little JTOP application here. Let me see if I can get to JTOP. And we can turn off the constant boost clock. And so we can run even more efficient. And I could just ask, where are you from again to Boromir? Um, so now instead of running at the maximum possible clock at all times, it's running a little bit lower than that. And that makes it a little bit more power efficient. I'd say that overall on this NX, we're probably running at 30 to 35 watts total to do the full LLM inferencing and the yellow V8 all at once at this speed. Yeah, I guess that's probably, you could pass it up to questions at that point. Yeah. If you have any questions. Anyone has questions? <laughs>